Thank you. So how many of you would like to have a lot more money in your lives? Now, I said a lot more money in your lives. And how many of you have a lot more happiness in your lives? And how many of you can stand a heck of a lot more of both in your lives? You've come to the right place. My name is T. Harbecker. Welcome to The Millionaire Mind, The Secret Psychology of Wealth. The first thing I want to do is I want to acknowledge you for being here. There's a saying that says, 80% of success is just what? Who can tell me? <laughs> Showing up. So since I can't reach you all, I need you to do me a little favor. Simply reach around, pat both your neighbors on the back, and go, congratulations for being here. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage to really have a look at your life sometimes and admit what's going on. And most of us, well, we're not the best admitters, are we? kind of reminds you of this story about this lion who's walking along the path of the jungle and he comes across a monkey and he goes, hey monkey, who's the king of the jungle? And the monkey goes, you are sir, you are. He goes, that's right and don't you ever forget it. He keeps walking along the path and he comes across a snake and he goes, hey snake, who's the king of the jungle? The snake goes, you are sir, you are. He goes, that's right and don't you ever forget it. He keeps walking along the path, comes across a great big elephant. He goes, hey elephant, who's the king of the jungle? The elephant just keeps walking. He goes, hey elephant, who's the king of the jungle? The elephant just ignores him. The lion gets really mad, swipes the elephant on the butt, draws blood. The elephant gets angry, picks up the lion with his trunk, throws him around, fires him on the ground, stomps on his head, picks him up, throws him around, fires him on the ground, stomps on his head, picks him up, throws him against a tree, and the battered and bloody lion just by there hey, you don't have to get mad just because you don't know the right answer. And you might as well laugh now because it don't get any better, okay? <laughs> Anytime I do any training, I have two rules. How many rules? Yeah. How many rules? Yeah. Thank you. The first rule is really important. It says this. Don't believe a word I say. Now, in all sincerity, why would I suggest that? That's right. Whose experience can I come from? Thank you. Just my experience. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't make it true. And it doesn't make it false. It just makes it my experience. All I can let you know, however, is that the information and principles you're about to learn here tonight totally transformed my life and has now transformed the lives of literally thousands and thousands and thousands of other people. Is it okay if I tell you just a little bit about myself? Thank you. I guess my claim to fame is that I owned at least a dozen different businesses before I hit the age of 30, including one of those businesses was opening one of the first retail fitness stores in all of North America. Now, the interesting thing about that company is that I started that business with $2,000 that I borrowed on my Visa card. And from there, I was able to open 10 company-owned locations in only two and a half years and then sold half my company shares to a Fortune 500 company for $1.6 million. How many wouldn't mind starting with a $2,000 credit card loan and having a million and a half dollars in your pocket a couple years after that? <laughs> Excellent. After that, I kind of semi-retired. I moved down to San Diego and I began doing some consulting, some one-on-one -on -one consulting. And uh, I guess it was pretty effective for people because they started bringing friends and relatives and managers and, and partners and pretty soon it was one-on-two and one-on-five and one-on-ten and one-on-twenty. And someone suggested, Harv, you might as well open up a school already. And I said, you know what? That is such a good idea. And I did. And I founded the Street Smart Business School and taught thousands of people all across North America street smart business strategies for high-speed success. What kind of success, please? High speed. Thank you. And it was during these seminars that I noticed something. I noticed something very, 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 very strange. Would you like to know what it was? Well, maybe I'll tell you next time. But what it was was simply this. You can actually have two people sitting side by side in exactly the same room. And one person would take these principles and they would skyrocket to success. But what do you think would happen to the person maybe sitting right beside them? Not a heck of a lot. And I realized right there, you can actually have the greatest tools in the world, but if you have just a tiny leak in the toolbox, we have a little problem. So I began designing programs based on the inner game. What game? Thank you. The inner game of money and success. And when we blended and combined the inner game with the outer strategies, with the outer tools, virtually everybody's results went through the roof. Does that make sense to y'all? Yes. A good example of what I'm talking about with this inner game is, how many of you know it's the phenomenon that when a millionaire loses their money, they generally have it back a very short time later? True? True. 
A good example of that is, have you heard of this fellow by the name of Donald Trump? Here's this multi-multi-billionaire who loses everything and more, and two years later, he's got it all back again and more. Why does this phenomenon happen? It happens because even though these people might have lost their money, they never lost their most important ingredient to their success, which was their what? Their millionaire? In Donald's case, it's his what? His billionaire mind. Do you realize that Donald Trump could never, quote unquote, just be a millionaire? Let me ask you your opinion. Are you willing? How do you think that Donald Trump would feel if his net worth was one million dollars? Yeah, he'd feel poor. He'd feel broke, right? Now listen, this is the most important thing you could ever learn. That's because Donald Trump's financial thermostat, his what? Is set for, everybody pick your finger up right here. Fingers up. They could be with me. Billions, not millions. Most people's financial thermostat is set for, fingers up, thousands, not millions. Some people's financial thermostat is set for, fingers up, hundreds, not even thousands. And some people's financial thermostat is set for, thumbs up, below zero. They're freezing and they don't know why. Which brings us to the psychology of wealth. It's very important to realize that we live in a world of duality. A world of what? Duality. Thank you. Help me out here. In and out. Give me some examples. Black and white. Hot and cold. Back and forth. Left and right. Up and down. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Let's take right and left. Is it possible to have a left side without a right side? Left of what, you see? They're a comparison. So just as there are outer laws to money, therefore there must be what? Excellent. You know, the fact is that most people do not reach their full potential. Most people are not successful. 80% of individuals will never become financially free in the way they would like to be financially free. And 80% of individuals will never claim to be truly, truly happy. And there's a reason. Would you like to know the reason? The reason is very simple. That most people are a little on the unconscious side. They live only on a very superficial level of life only based in the visible world, only based in what they can see. Now, a good example I'm talking about here is we're going to call this the tree of life. Tree of what? Life. Excellent. And on this tree grows what? Fur. Who said fur? <laughs> Fruits. What's the word? Fruits. Fruits. So we take it, a look at the fruits of our life, which are our results, right? And, and we don't like them. They're too small. They don't taste good. There's not enough of them, right? Well, what do we tend to do? Don't we tend to focus more and more of our energy and focus on those fruits, on those results? Yes? yes. Except for one thing that we forgot. What is it that created those particular fruits? It's what? Fruit. It's those roots that create those fruits. It's what's under the ground that creates what's above the ground. It's what's invisible that creates what's visible. True or true? Is that sometimes or all the time? Let me ask you a question. Is this the way it is in nature or not? Are you a part of nature? Then it may be the case that it might be the same with us, yes? All right, very good. So the most important thing that I think people need to realize that they just don't seem to get taught anywhere is that we don't live in only one realm alone. We live in at least four different worlds at once. We live in the mental world. What world? The mental world. We live in the emotional world. What world? world? We live in the spiritual world. What world? Spiritual. And absolutely, we live in the physical material world. And what most people never get is that your physical material world, your results, what actually happens to you is nothing more than a printout of the other three areas. These are the fruits, but these are the roots that cause those fruits. This is your result, but these are your causes. You know, does that make sense? Yes? This is what's above the ground, but this is what's below the ground. This is what's visible, but this is what's invisible that causes what's visible. So it boils down to this, that money in the real world, the real stuff, money, the physical reality, is nothing more than a result. It's a what? Money is a result. Wealth is a result. Health is a result. Illness is a result. Your weight is a? We live in a world of cause and E. 
Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever uh, heard anybody allude to the fact that a lack of money was a little bit of a problem? Anybody ever hear that? Let me say this right now. A lack of money is never, ever, 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 ever a problem. It's never a problem. A lack of money is merely a symptom. What's the word? <laughs> of what's going on underneath. Lack of money is just the result. What is the root cause? Meaning that the only way, the only way to permanently, what's the word please? <laughs> permanently change your outer world is to first change your what? You know what, we're going to give that some energy by doing a declaration together. Who can tell what a declaration is? A statement that we make what? Out, out loud. Thank you. And, you know, why does that work? And let me just put it this. I'm not going to get into the whole situation around it, but everything is one thing. Everything is energy. What is it? Energy. What is it? Energy. Everything is energy. And all energy travels in what? Frequencies and by? So when we make a statement out loud, we are sending a vibration, A, into the universe, and B, if we put our hand on our heart and our chest, we feel the, the vibration of that specific statement throughout the cells of our body. Yes or yes? You know, I know for a lot of you, you're thinking, oh my God, is this ever hokey. But the way I figure is this. I'd rather be really hokey and really rich than really cool and really broke. How about you? All right, please stand up. Let's have some fun. Let's have some fun with it. Good job. Now, here's what I want you to do. Put your hand on your chest, on your heart. Sir, your chest, not her chest. Come on, let's go. And simply repeat after me. My inner world creates my outer world. My inner world creates my outer world. Again. My inner world creates my outer world. One more time, twice as loud. My inner world creates my outer world. Now, turn to somebody, look them in the eye, give them a high five and say, you have a millionaire mind. <laughs> I wanted to share with you what's co something called the process of manifestation. The process of what? All right, help me out here. Your thoughts, your lead to your feelings, which lead to your which lead to your excellent. One more time, all together. Your thoughts lead to feelings, lead to. I'm very well known for making the following statement, and the statement is even on the very back of the book that we've been talking about. And it says this: It says, "Give me five minutes with anyone, and I can predict your financial future for the rest." of your life. How? Very simply. In a short conversation, I can identify what's called your money blueprint. Money what? Blueprint. Thank you. Each of us has a personal money blueprint already ingrained in our subconscious mind. And my friends, it is this blueprint, more than anything and everything else all combined, that will determine your financial life. You can know everything about business. You can know everything about, about marketing, about negotiations. You can be the best salesperson. You can be the best at your job. You can know everything about finances. You can know everything about stocks. You can know everything and every strategy about real estate. But if your money blueprint isn't preset for a high level of success, you will never, and I repeat, never, amass a large amount of money. And if by chance you do, you will either quickly or slowly lose it. It's very simple. It boils down to that. And the good news is you can actually change your blueprint. Good? So let's talk about the blueprint so you understand it. How is your blueprint formed? The blueprint is formed specifically based on the information. The what? Thank you. The information or programming you received in the past, especially as a young child. Who are some of the primary sources of this information? Parents. Parents. Good. Who else? Teachers. Yes, religious leaders. Good. Good. Friends. Grandparents. Good. Yes, media. Very good. Culture. Let's take culture. That's a good one. Isn't it true that certain cultures have a certain way of thinking and dealing with money? Yes. And other cultures have a completely different way of thinking and dealing with money? Yes. And let me ask you a question. Does a child come out of the womb doing it that way? Or were they taught how to do money that way? Thank you. Put your hand on your chest. Repeat after me. I was taught how to do money. I was taught how to do money. Thank you. And so was I. We were all taught how to do money. And unfortunately, most of us were taught by people who either didn't have a lot of it or who had a lot of emotional issues around it. True or true? 
So how are we taught? How are we conditioned? Three primary ways. How many? Three. You guys are doing great. Three. And the first way is called verbal programming. What kind of programming, please? Verbal. Thank you. That's all about what did, you, what did you hear when you were young? The second one's called modeling. What's it called? Modeling. Okay. That's all about what did you see when you were young? And the third one's called specific incidents. Specific what? Incident. That's all about what did you experience around money, wealth, and rich people when you were young? Now, let's talk a little bit about verbal programming. Let me hear some of the phrases that you heard about money, wealth, success, rich people when you were young. What some of the ones that you heard? Yes, money doesn't grow on. Yeah, what? Else? It takes money to. What else? Money doesn't make you happy. Good. Money's the root of all. Okay. We can't. Uh, yeah. There's never e. Rich people are. Greedy criminals, crooks, wonderful. That's, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. You can't take it with you, right? Spoken like a true spender. All right. <laughs> Do you want to hear my father's favorite? Anytime I asked him for anything, he'd growl at me and go, Hey, what am I, made of money? I used to joke around with him. I'd go, I wish. I'll take an arm, a leg. I'll take a baby finger, Dad. He never laughed once. Never once. Let me say this. All, what's the word? Each and every statement you heard when you were young, every one of those is lodged in your subconscious mind and part of the blueprint that is running your financial life. Let's talk about the next one, modeling. Here's an interesting one. What were your parents or guardians like in the arena of money when you were growing up? Did one or both of them manage money well, or did they mismanage money? Were they spenders or were they savers? Were they shrewd investors or were they non-investors? Did money come fairly easily in your household or was it always a struggle? Let me ask you this. Was money a source of joy in your home too? <laughs> or was it a source of bitter arguments? Why are we talking about this? Because there's a saying that says this, monkey see monkey and humans aren't far behind. So generally, we will tend to be exactly like, identical to one or a combination of both of our parents in the arena of money. Unless we're exactly the opposite. Why would someone be the opposite? That's right. It just depends on how angry you were at them or at the situation. You said, I will never live like this again. Got it? The third way is called specific incidents. Specific what? <laughs> specific incidents. Now, the best way to talk about that is with my own life and my own wife. Her name is Rochelle, and when she was eight years old, she would hear the clanging of the ice cream truck coming down the street, and she would run to her mom and ask her mom for a quarter, and her mom would say, sorry, dear, I don't have any money. Go ask dad. Dad's got all the money. She'd run on over to dad. She'd go get her quarter. She'd go get her ice cream. She was a happy camper. The next week, she'd hear the clang of the ice cream truck come down the street. She would run to her mom and ask her mom for a quarter. And her mom would say, help me out now. Sorry, dear, I don't have any money. Go ask your dad. Dad's got all the... She'd run on over to dad. She'd get her quarter. She'd go get her ice cream. She was a happy camper. Question! What did my wife learn about money? Yeah, first of all, that men have all the money. So when we first got married, what do you think she expected of moi? I'll tell you what, it wasn't quarters anymore. Somehow she graduated. What'd she learn about women and money? That's right, that women don't have money. Mom, the deity, didn't have any money, doesn't have money. Therefore, the way of being for a good woman to be is not to have any what? Any money. And so when, and whenever she had money, she'd have to what? Get rid of it. And she was darn good at it too. You know, she's very exact. You give her a hundred dollars, she spent a hundred. You give her two hundred, she spent two hundred. You give her five hundred, she spent five hundred. You give her a thousand, she spent a thousand. Then she took one of my programs, she learned all about the art of leverage. You give her I gave her two thousand, she spent ten thousand. There was only one thing we ever fought about. Can you guess what it was? money and it almost cost us our marriage and all I can say is thank God that we learned about the material we're talking about now and how to completely recondition our each of our own blueprints and this is important create a third blueprint for the relationship create a third blueprint for the what 
as an umbrella for the relationship. Now, I want you to know something. As many of you know, as many graduates, we have a, a three-day Millionaire Mind Intensive program. And one of the things I'm proudest about that program is what we're able to do for people in relationships around money. Because I know what was hurting me more than anything and biggest pain in my life. And what people don't really get is that each of you have your own blueprint, but you're going to need a third blueprint, like an umbrella blueprint, agreements, for example, on how the relationship's going to work around money. And most of us never entered a relationship with that in place, true or true. And most of us have never looked at it like that and go, let's create an umbrella, an umbrella blueprint, have we? And until you do, you'll always have problems with other people around money. So all I can say is that it worked like magic, and we have never had a disagreement since. We fought every single day. Now, you, you would think that's an exaggeration, wouldn't you? I wish. No. Some of you are going, no. <laughs> I wish. Every single day for nine and a half years. And we have never had a single disagreement around money since. And now it's been 11 years. Good or good? All right. Give that a hand. Hey, you can do better than that. Let me hear you. So the big question, even bigger question, the big question is this. What is your current money blueprint set for? Are you preset for success, for mediocrity, or for failure around money? Are you set for struggle with money or for ease around money? Are you set for working really hard for your money? Raise your hand if you're a big hard worker. Come on, let me see it. Where are you? Good. Nothing more than a preset pattern or program. That's all that is. Are you set for having a nice balance in your life? Are you set for having a very consistent income or an inconsistent income? You know, the up and down yo-yo effect. First you got it, then you don't. Then you got it, then you don't. Then you got it, then... Raise your hand if you know that one really good. Nothing more than a preset pattern. That's all that is. Are you, are you set for having a very high income, a moderate income, or a low income? Do you know there's actual numbered settings? So are you set for earning, you know, uh, uh, 25 to 50,000 a year? 50 to 75, 75 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 300, 300 to 500, nothing more than preset patterns and programs. And are you preset for saving money? Are you preset for spending money? Or are you set for avoiding the entire subject, if you could? <laughs> Absolutely. Are you set for managing money well or for mismanaging money? For picking winning investments or picking losers? for trusting people with money or distrusting people with money. How can you tell what you're set for? Well, one of the easiest ways is what? Look at the re Look at the fruits. That will tell you what the roots are set for. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. If the temperature in the room is 72 degrees, chances are really good the thermostat is set for how much, guys? 72. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Now, imagine that it's really hot outside and the windows are open. Is it possible that the temperature in that room could, say, get to 77 degrees? Yes or no? But what will eventually happen? Thank you. The thermostat will kick in and drive that temperature back down to, seven, to uh, 72 degrees. Now, is it possible that because the windows are open and it's very cold outside, that the, the temperature in the room could, say, go to 65 degrees? But what will eventually happen? Thank you. The thermostat will kick in and drive that temperature right back to 72. Meaning that the only way to permanently, what's the word? Thank you. Permanently change the temperature in that room is to change that what? Thermostat. And the only way to permanently, what's the word? Permanently change your, your money life, your financial results, is to change your money what? Thermostat, otherwise known as your money blueprint. Does that make sense to you? All right. Excellent. Now, Who can tell me one of the simplest ways to make change? Decide one. What else? Yes, become aware of it. Good, good. Yeah, someone said marry rich. That's good. That's close. That's good. <laughs> Obviously, one of the things we, one of the easiest ways to make a change is to model. What is it? Model, model people who have blueprints set for high levels of, of success. High levels of success. Yes? yes. And those people have a name. They're called rich people. And so one of the things we're going to do in the second part of the program here is talk just a little bit about how rich people actually think quite differently than most other people. But before we do that, we have to take a little stretch. So please stand up.
All right. Raising your arms nice and high. I want to hear a big, big groan. Let me hear you. Oh, good job. And this way. Oh, louder. And the other way. Oh, and backwards. Oh, and forwards. Oh. Give somebody a double high five and say, you're awesome. <laughs> and have a seat. Have a seat. All right, let's get into some of, th some of these things that are lots of fun. So the first way that rich people think quite differently than most poor and middle class people, and when I say poor and middle class, I mean the mentality more than that necessarily the result. Of course, it depends on that, yes? All right, so let's go to this one. Rich, you'll believe what? I create, one more time, twice as loud. I create my life. And most poor and middle class people, what do they believe? Life happens to me, life happens to me. If you want to create real wealth, it is imperative to believe that you are at the steering wheel of your life. You have to believe that you are the one who creates your success, you are the one who creating your mediocrity, and you are the one creating any financial struggle. Consciously or unconsciously is still you. But instead of taking full responsibility for what happens to them in their life, most people, well, they play the role of the what? The victim. Now, you can always tell a victim because they leave three indelible clues. And we're going to go over these right now. But before we do, I want you to realize that I do fully understand that what we're about to talk about here has nothing to do with anyone in this particular room. <laughs> but just in case you know someone who should have been here, make sure you bring them next time. Yes? Yeah. All right. So the first thing they do is what? They blame, that's right, they blame the economy, they blame their type of business, they blame the stock market, they blame the real estate market, they blame the city they live in, they blame the taxes, they blame the government, they blame their employer, they blame their employees, they blame their manager, they blame customer service, they blame their partner, they blame their upline, they blame their downline, they blame their husband, they blame their wife, and of course, everybody wants to blame their parents for something. <laughs> or the next thing they do is they do what? Thank you. They justify their situation by saying something like, well, you know, money's not that important. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. If you said that your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend wasn't that important, would they be around for very long? <laughs> I don't think so, and neither would what? You know, neither would money. And uh, people come up to me in my major seminars all the time, and they'll walk up and they'll say something like that. They'll say, well, you know, Harv, money's not that important, and I'll go, you're broke, aren't you? <laughs> and they'll go, well, right now I'm a little short. No, not right now, always. You've always been broke, yes or yes. And they go, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. of course they're broke. Of course they're broke. If you didn't think having a motorcycle was important, would you buy one, would you have one? Of course not. If you don't think having a pet parrot is important, would you buy one, would you have one? Of course not. If you don't think money's important, would you have any? Of course not. You know, you can actually dazzle your friends with this information. <laughs> the next time your friend comes up to you and says something lame like that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to roll your eyes up into here and look up into the heavens and put your hands up here on your forehead and go, you're broke. <laughs> and they're going to go, how did you know? And you're going to go, what else do you want to know? That'll be 50 bucks, please. And you have a whole new business. Of course they're broke. Let me just say this for the record. Anybody who says money is not important doesn't have any. True or true? All right, now, the third one here is absolutely imperative. What's, what's it say, please? Complain. Complain. Let me say this right now. Complaining is the absolute worst possible thing you could do for your health or your wealth. The worst. Why? Well, one of other programs is called the wizard training. What kind of training? And that's all about how do you manifest what you want with elegance and joy versus a lot of struggle. And the way to do that is using universal principles. And so you can be in alignment with the laws of nature instead of fighting against them. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. And one of those principles I'm sure you heard of, and it says this. I want you to repeat it. It says, what I focus on expands. Let me hear you. What I focus on expands. One more time. What I focus on expands. Tell somebody else, please. Excellent. Now, here it is. Let me ask you a question. When you are complaining, what are you focusing on? 
what's right with your life or what's wrong with your life. And since what you focus on expands, what are you now going to get more of? What's right with your life or what's wrong with your life? Absolutely, you're going to get more of what's wrong with your life. When you are complaining, you are actually attracting crap into your life. When you are complaining, you turn into this big, giant crap magnet. And have you ever heard that complainers, I mean, you know, they usually say the same thing. They say, well, of course I complain. Look how crappy my life is. And now you know better, so you can say, no, it's because you complain that your life is so crappy. Shut up and don't stand near me. So I'm going to give you some homework. Are you willing? An action plan. Now, here's what I want you to do. For seven days, how long? No complaining. Not out here and not in here. And when you can do that for seven days, I promise miracles will occur for you. And it's got to be a whole seven days. Why? Be because you still might have some you know, residual crap coming to you from before, right? Because crap doesn't travel at the speed of light, you know. It travels at the speed of crap, and it's really slow. So it has to be a whole seven days. Are you willing? All right, good job. Now, here's the thing you have to understand. Here's the secret. Are you ready for the secret? Yeah. No, nah, you're not ready. Are you ready for the secret? Yeah. All right. Lean forward. Hands on your ears. Let's see them. Okay, here we go. Ready? There's no such thing as a really rich victim. <laughs> Yet being a victim definitely has its rewards, doesn't it? What's the big reward people get out of being a victim? That's right, they get attention. Is attention important to most people? Yes. It's the most important thing to most people. Why? Because when we were infants, we made a mistake, and a big one, almost all of us. And what we did is we equated attention with love for the purposes of survival. But they're not the same at all. Does that make any sense? And because of that mistake, most of us really don't even know about true love. We know about what's called ego love, meaning we love another person 